Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Alice Chang, endocrinologist from the University of Toronto. And it is my pleasure to be presenting to you today on COVID-19 and diabetes, what is the relationship? And I'd like to thank the Care First group for giving me the opportunity to share this important information with you. So to put the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic in perspective, it's always worthwhile to take a look at the existing numbers. Now, as of the time of this presentation, we are at 23 million cases of coronavirus, COVID-19, in the world, with over 800,000 deaths. On the plus side, 15.7 million having recovered. However, the 800,000 deaths is particularly frightening when you try to put it in perspective. And for example, here is the University of Michigan football stadium, which is one of the largest stadiums in the world and it holds 107,000 people. And just to put it in perspective, to date, COVID-19 has been responsible for the deaths of seven and a half full of this stadium. So the toll that COVID-19 has had on humanity is quite significant and obviously on individual families, absolutely horrendous. But what we're gonna to do tonight is talk more about COVID-19 and particularly the situation in Canada, but then also focus on those living with diabetes and what one can do if you live with diabetes in order to reduce your risk surrounding COVID-19 infection. So what is the story here in Canada? And again, this is as of the time of this presentation, we are at over 124,000 people in Canada having been infected with COVID-19. Now this is a very large number in the context of our population of around 37 million. However, relative to other countries, particularly the one just to the south of us, the rate of infection in Canada is not considered among the world's highest. And that is certainly a testament to the amazing work that all of us have been involved in as citizens of Canada, as well as our leadership to try to control this pandemic. And some additional numbers from Canada. So this is as of August 21, 124,000 cases with 110,000 who have recovered. And I always like to show the recovered number because there is a lot of bad news out there and it is nice to see some good news. 4,600 active cases, but there are still 9,000 deaths that have occurred in Canada. And each of those deaths had families and loved ones and friends. And therefore we do need to be mindful of the number of people who have died from COVID-19. Looking over time, the daily number of reported COVID-19 cases across Canada as of August 15th are shown in this figure. Now on the Canada.ca website, you can easily find daily and weekly epidemiologic reports looking at COVID-19 in Canada. And as many of you recall, it was about mid-March when everything changed. Around mid-March was when things locked down in Canada. And you'll see why, because the number of cases started to go up. And despite the lockdown went up, up, up quite quickly and alarmingly and sort of peaked somewhere in mid to late April. And thankfully since then, through all of the efforts of all of us, those cases have certainly declined over time and sort of reached a bottom around late June and has in fact remained relatively flat over the course of the subsequent weeks. But what we need to take a look at is the distribution of those cases in terms of males, females, and as well across the age spectrum. So just to orient you, these are the various age groups, looking at those under the age of 19 all the way up to over the age of 80. And then here's the distribution of women and the distribution of men and then the total of the entire population. And one of the things that you'll notice is if you look at the raw numbers, it's very difficult to interpret 
how the age has affected the infection of COVID-19. But when you take a look at the rate, which represents the number of cases per 100,000 of that particular age group, you'll see that those 80 plus is alarmingly elevated. And I think this is reflective of the outbreaks that we experienced in Canada in our long-term care facilities, which was definitely devastating. But then when you look at the other age groups, the rates of infection are fairly evenly distributed with young people, i.e. children under the age of 19 being the least affected, but still affected nonetheless. So therefore this virus does not have eyes. It does not discriminate between the young and the old in terms of the ability to get the infection. However, the severity of the infection may in fact be different across age groups and as I'll show you later, across gender. Now, it's one thing to look at the number of cases, but the other thing that we are interested in is how many cases have required hospitalization. Because one of the biggest fears when the COVID-19 pandemic began was the possibility of overwhelming our healthcare system. And certainly as we watched our colleagues in China and then subsequently in Italy struggle with this pandemic, that became abundantly clear that the impact on the healthcare system could be tremendous. So if we take a look at hospitalization rates in Canada, the latest numbers would suggest that about 14% of the total cases of COVID-19 in Canada have required hospitalization. And of the 14% who were hospitalized, 20% required intensive care unit stay and about 4% required mechanical ventilation. So these numbers are particularly important because as a limited resource, that would of course be our hospital beds, our intensive care unit beds, and of course mechanical ventilation. And with this graph, you can see why there was such high anxiety and fear and concern in the early days of the pandemic as our numbers of hospitalized patients continued to climb. And therefore, healthcare facilities across the country were scrambling to become as prepared as possible. And although things were not perfect, I have to say that I think a really good job was done. And thankfully, our systems were never overwhelmed. However, we should never rest on our laurels and always be cautious about a potential second wave that can still occur. So therefore, our being vigilant about protecting ourselves must continue until the virus is under even further control or hopefully eradicated or a vaccine is in fact available. But you can see that the total hospitalizations, hospitalizations in the beginning were quite scary in terms of their exponential rise. And then thankfully we reached a peak and it has since come down and has stayed down. And the red line represents total ICU stays and that started to rise quickly, but also flattened and then eventually started to come down. So if we look at COVID-19 in Canada to date, the good news is that the numbers went up in the beginning, but then they flattened and then they started to come down. And like I said, that is thanks to all of the efforts that everyone has put into this. And with that, the numbers of hospitalizations have also come down thankfully, so that our healthcare system does not become overwhelmed. About 14% of cases require hospitalization, about 2.8% may require intensive care, and the overall mortality is about 7.5%. So what are the risk factors that determine if someone is going to have more severe COVID-19 infection? Now here, this is a list of the clinical factors that have been shown to contribute to more severe infection. <coughs> elevated age is one of the biggest predictors. Now you would say that elevated age is actually the biggest predictor of more severe any disease, any infection. So this is in fact true. But the older population tends to have more severe COVID-19 infection. And then interestingly, there's been a sex difference that has been apparent with COVID-19 around the world in that men are more severely affected. They're not more likely to become infected, but they are more severely affected when they become infected. In other words, the severity of their disease is much greater. And that may have something to do with testosterone 
and the role that it may play in how COVID-19 behaves in the body. In addition to that, weight has come out loud and clear as a significant risk factor for more severe infection. Now, interestingly, obesity is, again, one of those risk factors that affects every disease and tends to bring with it worse outcomes. However, in the case of COVID-19, obesity has come out loud and clear. In some of the other analyses that have come out now from various countries around the world, socioeconomic status seems to also play a significant role. Those who are living in lower socioeconomic status seem to have more disease as well as more severe disease. And ethnicity is also coming out fairly strongly in those countries with multiple different ethnicities living there. Particularly in the UK, we're starting to see lots of data pointing at how certain ethnicities, uh, such as Black or South Asian or Asian populations, seem to be more severely affected. And then there are comorbidities, of which diabetes is a prominent one that seems to bring with it higher risk for more severe COVID-19 infection. So what is the relationship with diabetes? And there's two things that we need to differentiate. There's the likelihood of becoming infected, and then there's the complications once one is infected. And this is an important differentiation because it appears that those living with diabetes are not at higher risk of getting COVID-19 infection. However, the severity of the disease can be greater in those living with diabetes. And one of our first indications of that were data coming from China in the early days of the pandemic. These are data that were out of the Chinese Center for Disease Control. And if you look at the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 infection for those who had diabetes, it was sitting at about 5% prevalence of diabetes amongst those who had COVID-19. And if you think about 5% prevalence, that's actually similar to or somewhat lower than the population prevalence of diabetes. And it's these data that would suggest that people living with diabetes are not more likely to get COVID-19 infection. However, the severity of disease does seem to be greater. And again, these were early data coming out of China showing that the case fatality rate was sitting at around 7% for those living with diabetes. But to put that in comparison, if somebody had no other conditions, so no pre-existing conditions, their case fatality was 0.9%. However, if one had any of these diseases listed here, the case fatality rates appeared to be higher. Now, this was in the early days of the pandemic, and since then, some of these other comorbidities have fallen off as not necessarily bringing higher risk. But diabetes does remain as one of those diseases that seems to bring higher risk when COVID-19 is in the picture. And diabetes, if you also have COVID-19, is associated with more severe disease and more deaths. And the reasons behind this are not entirely clear. We know that COVID-19 infection and complications of COVID-19 are very much related to inflammation. And we know that people with obesity have significant underlying chronic inflammation. And we also know that diabetes is associated with inflammation. And the question is whether those two things are sort of adding fuel to the fire if someone also has a COVID-19 infection. There's also a question out there of whether COVID-19 may directly impact the pancreas and the cells that produce insulin. This is of course still in theory. However, when looking at ACE2, so ACE2 to orient you is the receptor on the tissues of the body that COVID-19 sticks to. So if there are ACE2 receptors on those cells of the pancreas that make insulin, then could it be possible that COVID-19 has a direct effect on those cells? Now to answer that question, this is just an example of a study that was done closer, more related to SARS, but the idea of ACE2 remains the same, where they stained pancreas 
and looked at the islet cells. So just to orient you, islet refers to the kind of cells within the pancreas that make insulin. Contrast that with the other cells of the pancreas, the exocrine cells that do not make hormone, but are involved in digestion. So you can see that in this picture, the islet cells are here in the middle. Now, when you put a, a control solution, meaning something that's not particularly active, you can see that you cannot differentiate between the islet cells and the exocrine cells. But then if you apply a stain where it sticks to ACE2, you'll see that the color sticks to what appears to be the islet cell, suggesting that ACE2 may in fact exist on the islets and perhaps COVID-19 has a direct effect on the pancreas. Now, this has yet to be proven definitively. And with all of the recovered cases that have occurred around the world, it would be very interesting to see if there's in fact a rise in new diabetes after COVID-19 infection. But you can see in this review article that was published in July, looking at some of the effects of COVID-19 outside of the lungs. So extrapulmonary means outside of the lungs. So what are some of the potential manifestations of COVID-19 infection outside of the lungs? So if you take a look on the left, there are neurologic or brain affecting things such as headaches, dizziness, encephalopathy, Guillain-Barre, et cetera, et cetera. Anosmia has been talked about quite a lot, which is the loss of smell. Uh, so that has been associated with COVID-19 infection. Our nephrology colleagues, our kidney specialists have also noted an acute kidney injury that may occur with COVID-19 infection. And one of the other pieces of equipment in the early days of COVID-19 that we were afraid of running out of was not just ventilators, but also dialysis machines as patients who had severe COVID-19 infection we're also requiring dialysis. At the level of the liver, there may be increases in some of the blood tests and causing an inflammation of the liver. In the bowels, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting was also one of the potential symptoms of COVID-19 infection. In addition, in more severe disease, there were patients who were developing blood clots in places that should not clot, such as the lungs and other veins. For the heart, there seemed to be a direct COVID-19 effect on the heart, creating a stunning of the heart or things that almost looked like heart attack, but in fact, it wasn't heart attack, but a stunning of the heart muscle. And then on the endocrine side of things, there's mention here about potential direct effects on the pancreas causing high blood sugar. And then in addition on the skin, there've been a number of skin things that have also been described with COVID-19 infection. So in the past eight months now, we have learned a tremendous amount at a very fast rate about this infection and what it can do. And this is the current understanding of some of the outside of the lung effects that COVID-19 may have. Now I've already mentioned that obesity or increased weight is also a significant risk factor. And this figure tries to explain why that might be. Now this is obviously in medical terms, so I'm gonna do my best to explain what they are saying. In the first yellow box, they're talking about the issue of obesity and too much fat, especially in the middle part of the body. Now we know that fat cells are very active cells and they make lots of hormones and are also pro-inflammatory. And with obesity and with excess fat cells, that does have an effect on the lungs themselves and that the ability to blow up the lungs completely is impaired when one has significant obesity. On top of that, those who have obesity also have increased stress on the heart and the kidneys, tend to also have high blood pressure, may also have diabetes, which can further worsen the situation. And both of these things, the effects on the lungs, the effects on the heart and the kidneys and the metabolism, can result in lower cardiorespiratory reserve, meaning that the, the reserve that the lungs and the heart have for those patients is not as great as a young, healthy, normal body weight individual. And then on the flip side, excess fat tissues also have an effect on the immune system, such that the immune system may actually be hyperreactive because one of the problems with severe COVID-19 infection is that the immune system freaks out and is too strong and sends out too big of an army and sends out a very indiscriminate army that attacks things it doesn't need to attack. 
So that overwhelming immune response is part of the problem with COVID-19 infection. And those who have excess fat cells may have a dysregulation or an abnormal immune system that may contribute to that. And then in theory, there may be increased viral shedding associated with the fat cells themselves, but this of course is theoretical. And then this may then contribute to immune hyperreactivity or too much reaction of the immune system. So together, you can see how that could lead to more severe COVID-19 infection. So bottom line, excess fat cells plus diabetes plus age plus male sex seem to be significant issues that can contribute to more severe COVID-19 infection. Now, is there a difference though between type one and type two diabetes? Because they are very different types of diabetes. Type one diabetes, just to orient everybody, is much less common. It's about 10% of people who have diabetes. And type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease whereby your own body has attacked your pancreas so that those islet cells, the ones that make insulin, are no longer functioning. So therefore, those people do not make insulin and must take insulin for life. Type 2 diabetes is the more common form. 90% of people have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is what's previously been called adult onset diabetes, although we don't really use that term because we're now unfortunately finding type 2 in children as well. But type 2 diabetes is a disease of two problems. One is that the body has become resistant to insulin, often related to excess weight. And then number two, the pancreas is unable to keep up with that resistance, is not able to just produce more to overcome the resistance. So then you have a problem of both insulin resistance as well as relative insulin deficiency because the pancreas can't keep up. So these are two different kinds of diabetes. And although both of them cause high blood sugar, they're quite different in terms of the type of people and how that happens. So does COVID-19 affect both types of diabetes in a similar fashion? Well, some of the best data we have has come out of the United Kingdom where they have fantastic database to look at all types of patients and outcomes in hospitals, et cetera. And unfortunately, they also had many cases of COVID-19, so we're able to collect these data. And they looked at type 1 and type 2 diabetes with COVID-19 related mortality or death in England. And what they found when they looked at in-hospital COVID-19 death rates, again, per 100,000 persons, in the general population, it's the black line. And this is across the age spectrum. So clearly the youngest age group, you get very little increase in death or very little death, I should say, associated with COVID-19 in the younger age group. But as the ages get older, you'll see there are more deaths involved. But regardless of which age group you're looking at, those living with diabetes, whether it's type one in the red or type two in the blue, had higher death rates relative to the general population. Again, supporting the notion that diabetes seems to factor into this equation. And when you look at comparing type one versus type two diabetes, it actually looked like type one diabetes carried higher risk, which is not necessarily what I would have expected, given that those living with type two tend to be older and tend to have more issues with weight. So this is somewhat surprising. And when they looked at 23,000 in hospital deaths, the things that came out as important risk factors were age, as mentioned, male sex, as mentioned, social deprivation or lower socioeconomic status, non-white ethnicities, and then as well, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So then does controlling sugar make a difference, which I think is, is a very valid question to ask. And, and I get asked this by my patients all the time because it's the issue of I hear on the news that diabetes is one of those risk factors and that frankly that's frightening listening to that as I'm sitting at home in my living room and I know I have diabetes. So then they often wanna know, well, what if it's type one versus type two? And I've shown you the data for that. Well, what if somebody has, has glycemic control or has controlled their sugars lower versus another person whose blood sugars are higher? Does that make a difference in terms of severity of the COVID-19 infection? And some of the best data we have to answer that question is again coming from the United Kingdom where they looked at deaths in hospital due to COVID-19 and then they looked back 
to prior to hospitalization in their family practice records and tried to find the closest A1C. A1C, to remind you, is the blood test that looks at sort of average blood sugars over the prior three months. So they look back in the records to look for their closest A1C and try to correlate to see if there's a, an association between glycemic control prior to hospitalization and then ultimately the deaths that occurred. So when they looked at those who had A1Cs less than 7.5% compared to those with A1Cs 7.5 or greater coming into hospital or prior to hospitalization, I should say, it appeared that those who had higher A1Cs prior to hospitalization did have greater hazard ratio or greater probability of death compared to those who had lower blood sugars coming in. Now, this is not cause and effect. I mean, what this tells us is that is exactly what I said. Those who had higher sugars coming in did not do as well. But does that mean that sugar is a direct benefit? No. It could just be that the people with higher sugars maybe had other problems with them. Maybe it was more of a marker of other illnesses or a marker of how well uh, they took care of their health overall. I mean, it's hard to say that it's exactly cause and effect, but that association does appear to be real. And again, when they looked at in-hospital COVID-19 deaths by baseline A1C, and then looked at their type of diabetes, it seemed like those who had the highest A1Cs coming in, suggesting they had higher blood sugars coming in for a period of time prior to getting sick, they also had the higher likelihood of getting of dying from COVID-19. So therefore, it seems like the level of glycemic control coming in to COVID-19 infection does impact the outcome. Therefore, does controlling sugar before you get sick make a difference? That specific question has not been answered. But in my mind, these data are suggestive of that. So then it becomes a situation of let's control what I can, and my blood sugars is one of the things I can control, but I'll come back to that concept. The other thing to look at when asking does blood sugar affect COVID-19 outcome is what was the blood sugars like in hospital? So this group looked at the in-hospital blood glucose of those infected with COVID-19 and then associated that with their risk of mortality or death. And it seems like those whose blood sugars in hospital were lower had less death than those whose blood sugars were higher when they were in the hospital. And there was an interesting graphic that the group developed, which looks like this. They sort of used a set of stairs as their analogy, saying that those with blood sugars that were lower while they were in hospital were more likely to survive whereas those whose blood sugars were higher in hospital were more likely to die. Now, again, one potential interpretation is that controlling blood sugars in hospital will reduce death, but this is not what this proves because it is also possible that those with higher blood sugars in hospital were sicker patients. And we know that the degree of infection, how sick someone is, um, how much inf inflammation is going on will raise blood sugar. So maybe the blood sugar was simply a marker of a sicker patient. Therefore, we saw more deaths. But this is an interesting association that is worth noting. And then in, in China, this was a group that looked at newly diagnosed people. So one of the things that can happen is if you have COVID-19 infection, you either have known diabetes coming in, or you have completely normal sugars, or when you show up, they discover your diabetes for the first time. And what's interesting, and this was shown by, by a Chinese group, but there was just a recent publication from an Italian group that also showed very similar results, that those who actually had unre previously unrecognized diabetes possibly, who now presented with COVID-19 with elevated blood sugars actually did the worst. So the cumulative hazard of mortality, so the risk of death was actually the highest in this group with newly diagnosed diabetes. 
higher than the group with known diabetes and higher than the group that just was a little bit high in their blood sugar, but not really diabetes, and obviously much higher than those with normal blood sugars. Now, again, this is not to directly prove that sugar affects COVID-19. What this could mean is that those people who are newly diagnosed were either unrecognized diabetes coming in and therefore maybe their healthcare was not as great, or the fact that they were so much sicker that their blood sugars were so much higher, which then resulted in the new diagnosis of diabetes. So this is again, not proof that controlling sugars help, but does show that there's a relationship of some sort between sugar and COVID-19 severity. So then another important question that people will ask is, does the choice of what I use to treat my diabetes have an impact on COVID-19 infection? And in the beginning, there were all sorts of theories. There were all sorts of theories about things to not take, like ACE inhibitors or ARB, certain blood pressure medications that most people with diabetes are on. It turned out that theory was wrong and that in fact you should stay on your blood pressure medications and that it may even be good for you to stay on them, but they're certainly not bad for you. So there were all sorts of theories out there about how something may be theoretically good or theoretically bad, but really what we need is to look at the data and unfortunately we have lots of people with diabetes and COVID-19 around the world, so what happened to them and can we come up with any kind of observations? This is one of the larger studies that have come out looking at this from France and have tried to correlate the kind of treatment people were taking before they were hospitalized and then looking at their primary outcome. And the bottom line was that nothing really stood out as a problem. Nothing really stood out as a savior either, but nothing stood out as a problem. So therefore, the type of treatment is unlikely to affect the outcome of COVID-19 infection. The studies that have shown a potential relationship, once they control for other factors was gone. Because there's some data to suggest that those taking insulin did not do as well. But who takes insulin? People who are older, people who've likely had diabetes for longer, and perhaps those who have more obesity, which again are risk factors that we know affect outcome. So once they've controlled for other things, the insulin does not necessarily become an association anymore. One of the latest studies to come out have suggested that perhaps the use of metformin is actually good in terms of reducing mortality in those with COVID-19 and diabetes. But I would be very cautious in interpreting these data because again, it's just associations. And we could argue that those who take metformin, which is sort of standard of care really for diabetes management, and, and then you compare that to a group that does not take metformin, I mean, why are they not taking metformin? Is it the type of healthcare they've received? Do they also have kidney disease so they cannot take metformin? Uh, you, you gotta ask the questions of how are those two groups different and, and why would metformin be beneficial? So this, I'm showing you this more to remind you that any headlines that you read, and, and there are lots of headlines nowadays around coronavirus, you just need to take all the data with, with, with some a healthy skepticism and some understanding of the scientific process as to whether there's over concluding happening, uh, which is human nature to look at some data and then want to jump to conclusions. But we need to understand the limitations of the data that are being collected. There's a group of medications out there called SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, they are the glyphlozins, and this is just one example of a glyphlozin. So there's dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, um, canagliflozin, and they work through the kidneys and allow you to pee out sugar. And they've been amazing drugs that have been shown in the last, uh, I guess, seven or last five years or so to reduce heart attack, strokes, and death, to reduce hospitalizations for heart failure and to reduce kidney disease in people living with diabetes. So they've become very co more commonly used drugs in our treatment of those living with type two diabetes. But there are also medications that should not be used when one is feeling unwell and not able to eat and drink enough. So therefore in the context of COVID-19 infection, a lot of people had been in the early days 
preemptively stopping the SGLT2 inhibitor, which was perhaps the wrong thing to do because we could wait until someone were to get sick with anything, not necessarily COVID-19, but even the stomach flu or anything that causes diarrhea, they should hold the medication. But there's actually an interesting study that's underway looking at using SGLT2 in people with COVID-19 to actually see if there is either benefit or more likely safety with continuing to use it in that population. So this is an interesting study. Again, I'm showing you that the study is not finished, so we do not know the answer, but there are lots of uh, very good studies underway looking at COVID-19 and how we should be treating it. So what can you do, right? I mean, I spent a lot of time talking about how, you know, we've got COVID-19, it's a big deal, obviously. It's affected every corner of the world. Uh, within Canada, we've, we've done a really good job of controlling things, but we're certainly not out of the woods. And those living with diabetes are at higher risk of more severe infection. Okay, so this is all very doom and gloom. So what, what can you do, right? What can I do to protect myself from getting the infection? And I think the most important things we can do are the things that our public health leadership has told us for quite some time social distancing, physical distancing, whatever term you want to use, it's staying away from people. As in stay, you know, two arms lengths away from people, two meters away from people. Because the virus does not have arms or legs or, or wings, right? So therefore we need to bring it to people. And if we're able to keep our distance, there's less likelihood of transmission. So physical distancing or social distancing, face masks we now know do have a role. They are not perfect by any means, but better than not wearing them. And then in this study, they also looked at eye protection and of course, hand washing, which we'll come back to. But this is actually an excellent systematic review and a meta-analysis. So they sort of looked at a whole bunch of studies and tried to put them together and synthesize it. And what I really like about this study is what it shows here in a very understandable terms. So if we talk about social distancing or physical distancing, what does that actually mean in numbers? Without the intervention, so without social distancing, chance of infection or transmission would be about 12.8%, whereas with physical distancing, it drops to 2.6%. So there is benefit to be had by maintaining that physical distancing. What about wearing face masks? So without face masks, transmission may be 17.4%. With face masks, drops to 3.1%. Here they've also included eye protection, but you'll notice with both face mask and eye protection, the certainty of the evidence is relatively low because the studies are not that large and not that robust. But with eye protection, 16, or without eye protection, 16%, with eye protection, 5.5%. So therefore, social distancing and face masking definitely has benefit. And if you can, eye protection can also be helpful. And some of the other data that have looked at the concept of universal masking came out of hospitals in the United States. So this is looking at the uh, Massachusetts group and this is a, a large group of hospitals uh, in the Boston area. And you can see the timeline here that starting around early to mid-March, they started to see cases of positivity of COVID-19 in healthcare workers in those hospitals. And it started to climb rather sharply uh, and somewhat scarily. And you can see that Massachusetts response was the state of emergency, March 10th, and then closing schools on the 16th, reducing public transit on the 14th, and stay at home order March 24th. At the hospital level, they restricted visitors to start, restricted elective procedures, restricted business travel, and then by March 25th, implemented universal masking. But up until then, there was already a sharp rise in the number of cases amongst healthcare workers. And then when universal masking was instituted, there seemed to be a plateauing of the number of cases. And then here on April 6th, they implemented universal masking of patients as well. And then with time, there seems to now be a decline in the number of cases. And this is still within the month of April. So it wasn't like Massachusetts was declining. Massachusetts was not declining, but the hospital was starting to see improvement. So this is 
indirect evidence of benefit in this one place of universal masking. And then of course, washing hands, right? I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, hand washing is absolutely critical because we touch our faces as I have just done, as I've been speaking. And it's, it's uh, even though we tell ourselves not to touch our face, we inevitably will. And if, we, if our hands are clean, even if we do touch our face, we're less likely to be bringing stuff to our face. And it's not so much bringing it to my cheek, it's more if when I rub my nose or I rub my eyes or somewhere around my, my nose or my mouth and then my ability to bring it in at that point and then potentially cause infection. I, I show you this slide only to say, for those of you who are interested, this is a wonderful website. It's called washyourlyrics.com and you can put in your favorite song and then it will come out with a poster like this that goes through the lyrics and what stage of hand washing you should be at what part of the song so that you would actually spend the necessary 20 seconds washing your hands. So this is an example using Billie Jean by Michael Jackson and what the lyrics would look like. So I'd encourage you guys to take a look at it and play with it and, and plug in your favorite song and then uh, sing to yourself when you're washing your hands. The other thing you can do in general to protect yourself if you haven't done so already is to download the COVID alert app. Uh, that has been issued by the government of Canada. It is an app that works through Bluetooth technology. A privacy has been very strongly maintained with the app. It does not take down any of your information. It is not tracking you from a GPS perspective, but it's using Bluetooth technology to recognize other phones that you are near. And then should somebody that you've been exposed to end up developing COVID-19, they would then enter a anonymous code into the app and that feeds into a server which would then go back in history and figure out which phones that phone had been in contact with and then they would then notify those phones that you may have been exposed it doesn't say by whom to whom when where it doesn't give you those details so you cannot figure it out who it was but it gives you an alert that you may have been exposed so please go get tested. I, it's not a perfect system, nothing is. However, I think this is pretty good, but it will only work if as many people as possible download the app and have it on when they are outside of their house because it is Bluetooth technology. So you do have to have it on when you are out. And then that way, the more people that have it, the greater likelihood that something like this would be successful. So I would encourage all of you to download this. Now in the context of diabetes, what can I do to protect myself? So I'm, I'm gonna social distance, I'm gonna face mask, I'm gonna wash my hands, I'm gonna do all of those good things. But what else can I do if I have diabetes? So I think a very important thing to remember, and I'm gonna repeat this a few times, because I've spoken to many patients of mine who have great anxiety and fear about this, understandably so, because of all the stuff I said at the beginning, right? Diabetes is a risk factor for more severe disease. You hear that on the news, you see that in the newspaper. It's, it can freak people out. But remember, you have no control over what someone else does, but you can only control what you do. So you cannot control if other people are maintaining their social distance or washing their hands or if they're wearing their mask. You can't control the people who are still having reckless parties out there. You can't control any of that. What you can control is what you do within the context of yourself. So the things that you can control is you do social distancing, face masking, hand washing, and your food choices you do have control over. Now, there are stuff on the internet about, you know, superfoods and foods for your immune system and all of that stuff. None of that stuff has great proof behind it. I think bottom line is eating healthy, right? So eating balanced is ultimately a good idea as much as possible. Uh, I think early on in the lockdown, there was a lot of comfort eating that was happening and, and a lot of banana breads being baked, interestingly. Uh, but I think a lot of that is settling back down and, and choices of foods that we make are important, particularly in the context of diabetes management. So being conscious of the food choices you're making. Physical activity. Yes, you can go for a walk. I have many patients ask me that. So if you live in a house and you live on a street where there is a sidewalk, then it's safe for you to be walking outside. 
Uh, you can try your best to social distance from people when you are walking. You may want to pick times of the morning or the evening where there's fewer people out there on the road that are walking. Um, but yeah, absolutely, physical activity is possible. If you have a backyard, you can use your backyard. Uh, if you live in a condo, that's going to be a little bit more challenging, uh, depending on the hallway of the condo and how many people. That may not be the safest place, but around the building, that may be possible. But physical activity is still helpful you can control whether or not you take your medications. And although I said there's no proof that sugar control protects you, it might. There's an association between high sugars and not so good. So maybe sugars that are controlled would be better. So why not take the benefit of the doubt and try your best to improve the sugar control during this time and test your sugars because Digging your head into the sand like an ostrich is not going to help the situation. Control the things you can. And controlling your sugars is one of the things you can try to control. But you can only control your sugars if you know what your sugars are. So that's where testing your sugars can be an important part. And I think this is important. This moment may actually be an opportunity. During this time, people have been working from home, have been at home much more than before are no longer traveling on business trips or whatever other kind of trips they were on. So for many of my patients, when I've been calling them and having their appointments, this has actually been an opportunity to learn how to cook because you're not able to go out to eat as readily, uh, to learn how to grocery shop safer, to pick healthier foods, uh, to you might actually have a bit more time on your hands to start exercising because you're no longer commuting for two hours to and from work. Um, so this may actually be an opportunity to focus on your health. And this is maybe something good to take out of all of the bad. And I've definitely seen this in my patients. I have definitely seen patients with whom I have followed up where everything has gotten better. And when we talk about why that's happened, a lot of it is not eating out, cooking at home, uh, being able to walk, having the time to actually take their medications, to test their sugars, and to uh, focus on themselves. So this may actually be an opportunity, and I would like for you to think of it in that context. And then the other thing you can do is be prepared. Okay, so what do I mean about being prepared? So if you get sick and you live with diabetes, and when I say sick, I'm not just talking COVID-19, I'm talking sick of any kind the flu, stomach flu, um, some other kind of sickness. When you get sick, there are certain things you should all do if you live with diabetes to avoid getting sicker or to avoid the diabetes complicating things. So number one is to stay hydrated. So doing your best, if you're not able, if you're throwing up or you're having diarrhea, to try to stay hydrated as best as you can. And if you absolutely cannot stay hydrated, then that's when going to the hospital may be something to consider. If you take insulin therapy, do not stop your insulin. If you take insulin therapy, it is because we feel that your pancreas is not able to produce enough on its own. So even if you're not eating and drinking well, your body still requires insulin to function. So stopping your insulin when you're not eating and drinking well may actually make things worse because now your body's also missing insulin, which can cause other problems to occur. So generally, we advise people not to stop their insulin. And in fact, they may need more insulin when they're not eating and drinking well. The most important thing to do if you're on insulin and you're sick is continue your basal insulin, which is the background insulin. Lantus, Levomir, Traceba, Tugeo, NPH, those are the names of them. Those, that one should continue. But if you're on food time insulin, meal time insulin, then that's the one you can skip if you're not going to eat that meal. But you got to test your sugars more often. So that means testing them every couple of hours because in illness, blood sugars can actually go up even though you haven't eaten. So if that's the case and you're seeing your sugars going up, 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 you actually need to give yourself mealtime insulin even though you haven't eaten to try to bring that down. And then there may be other medications that need to be temporarily held and I'll show you what those are. So this is a sick day management handout developed by Diabetes Canada which is available at the Diabetes Canada website if you search the word sick day. And it goes through, you know, if you're sick, how to stay fluid hydrated. It talks about preventing low blood sugar 
if you're not eating and drinking well, what your sources of sugar might be. And then it also talks about certain medications to hold if you become acutely ill. And they're outlined on this list here. Now, these names will not be familiar to you, but on this handout, there are the actual brand names of some of those drugs listed here. So I would encourage you to go to the Diabetes Canada website and to access some of this information. And then on the flip side, you can also develop low blood sugar just by virtue of having diabetes on insulin or on a sulfonylurea. So sulfonylurea would be glycoside, also known as dimicron, or glyburide, also known as diabeta. So if you're on insulin or you're on dimicron or you're on diabeta, you are at risk of a low blood sugar regularly. So you should know what a low sugar feels like and a low sugar is defined as a sugar under four. And this is what low sugars feel like. Sweating, fatigue, dizziness, confused, um, in severe cases, convulsion, feeling weak, increased appetite, there may be loss of consciousness, and in extreme cases, you could be completely passed out. So shaky, sweaty, hungry, that's usually what I say to patients, right? Hypoglycemia feels like shaky, sweaty, hungry. And if you feel those symptoms, you must test your blood sugar in order to see, is it below four? And if it is below four, the treatment is simple, sugar. But it needs to be fast sugar. What some of my patients do is they take a cookie or they take ice cream. The problem with a cookie or ice cream is they have plenty of sugar, but it's also mixed with a lot of fat. And fat slows down the absorption of sugar. So actually what you need if you are having a low blood sugar right now is you need fast sugar. And fast sugar comes in the form of actual glucose tablets or honey or sugar in water, uh, two thirds of a cup of juice or six lifesavers or two rolls of the rocket candies. I mean, there's all different options available to you, but these are quick sugars. And notice the amounts that we're talking about. It's not a whole can of Coke. Because a whole can of Coke is going to give you actually three times the sugar that you actually need to recover. Um, so the portion sizes are relevant, but first treatment is fast sugar. And every one of you who has insulin or dimicron or diabeta should in your pocket or your purse at all times be carrying some candy or some form of treatment for potential hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. But after you have the fast sugar, you need to recheck your blood sugar to make sure it's come up. But then you then need slow sugar because the, low sh the, the hypoglycemia, the low blood sugar may come again. So fast sugar is fast, but then it also doesn't last. So you're also gonna need slow sugar. So after the fast sugar, you wait 15 minutes and you recheck your blood. If it's above four, then you've done a good job. You've raised the blood sugars back to a safe level. And if your next meal is within the hour, then you're fine. You can just wait till your next meal. If your blood sugar comes back above four, but your next meal is over an hour away, then you need to eat something that's more substantial. And more substantial means carb plus protein. So that's where you'd have crackers or bread with cheese or with peanut butter or with something that's going to last a bit longer. But if you check and it's still below four, then you gotta go back up and you gotta give more fast sugar to try to get that blood sugar up. This is information at any time, not just in COVID time, but particularly in COVID time when we want to avoid taxing on the healthcare system unnecessarily, and of course wanting to remain safe, we need to be very familiar with hypoglycemia treatment. So if you are on insulin or you're on glyburide, glycoside, which is diabeta or dimicron, Make sure you've got supplies to treat low blood sugars in your pocket. And then ask your doctor as well about, there's an emergency kit available now for low sugars in case you pass out and then people around you can help you. So you can ask your doctor about that as well. Now I'm gonna end off with a series of questions that are sort of quickies, but really important ones. These are questions that my patients ask me often and, and I felt was appropriate to be answering in this context. The first one is if I don't feel well, is it still safe to go to the hospital? And this is a not uncommon question. I think now in August, it's a little less of a question. People are becoming a little bit more comfortable 
But certainly back in March and April and May, this was a very common question. And the answer is a resounding yes. Because unfortunately, one of the side effects of this COVID-19 pandemic was during the months of March, April, May, a lot of people who were having chest pain, shortness of breath, i.e. a possible heart attack, were staying at home out of fear of going to the hospital. So then by the time people ended up in hospitals with their heart attacks, they were far further along with more muscle damage and much more severity. So people being afraid to go to the hospital were delaying care, and that was ultimately a bad thing. Now, the COVID-19 fear took away some of the things that did not need to go to the hospital. But for, if you really are feeling unwell and you normally would have gone to the hospital, I would encourage you to still please do so. The hospitals are super careful, very careful about emergency room entrances, what kind of patients go where, et cetera. So by all means, especially if you're having chest pain or shortness of breath, or you're having stroke-like symptoms, you go to the hospital. If you're having a problem with your foot, foot ulcers, foot infections, again, that was something that people were afraid to go to hospital for or afraid to ask to see their doctor. And those foot ulcers and infections got worse quickly. So care is still available. If you need it, you should still go for it. Should I still get my blood work done, right? One of the things in diabetes care, and those of you who see me know this, but for those of you who see any other endocrinologist, you know this, it's all about the blood work, right? We always want you to get blood work done before we see you because it helps us to make decisions with you about the therapies that make sense. So is it safe to get your blood done? The answer, absolutely resounding, yes, please. Go get your blood work done. Where can you get your blood work done? Well, the community labs, many of the community labs are accepting appointments. You can make appointments online. I would encourage you to make an appointment online because then it's safer. You, you show up at your time, you sign in, you get your blood done, you go home. Versus walk-ins. I think labs are now, some labs are allowing walk-ins. But with the walk-in, because of physical distancing, you may be lining up for hours and it's not worth it. It doesn't make sense to do that. It makes far more sense just to go online or have a loved one go online for you or call for some of the places you might be able to call to book an appointment so that you go and they're ready for you. But please get the blood work done because it does help make treatment decisions. Then there's the question of how can I prepare for my virtual appointment with my team? This one I think is very important because it not only impacts you, it also impacts me. And as you know, all of our appointments have changed and they changed quickly. Like literally on a Friday in March, I was still seeing patients. And then Sunday I went into the office to call my patients for Monday to tell them not to come in. And then by Monday I was doing all phone calls. And I've been doing all phone calls since mid-March. And it's actually been very successful. And your team may have two ways of communicating with you, either by old fashioned telephone or virtual. So what can you do to prepare for these visits to make them the most efficient, but more importantly, the most effective so that you get what you need out of the appointment? So these are sort of my tips as to what you can do to prepare for the appointment. Have your medications in front of you, right? So if you know that I'm supposed to call around 10 a.m., then have your medications laid out on whatever table you're likely going to be sitting at when the phone call appointment occurs. Have your reading glasses near as well, because then again, that just saves time and it's less frustrating when you're trying to read the bottle and read the names to me. Have a pen and paper nearby so that you can take notes. Uh, if I give suggestions for changes to doses, then you can mark them down. It also gives you an opportunity to write down any questions you'll have for me so that we can, again, have a very useful appointment. Have your pharmacy information readily available, but the good news is that's often on the bottle of your medication. So that's why having your bottles or boxes near you is going to take care of that. And prepare any questions that you may have so that, again, we can have an effective appointment for both of us to get the information that we need to get across. And then finally, your blood sugar readings. In the diabetes world, I'm asking all the time what your blood sugar readings are like. 
Now, it depends on the kind of technology that you're using to measure your blood sugars. If you are using the Libre, the Freestyle Libre, which is the patch on the arm that you can scan, well, then you may want to call the office ahead of time or, or your nurse ahead of time and ask them how to connect via the computer to the clinic so that I can actually see your readings and we can talk about the same thing together at the same time while I'm looking at it on my computer screen and you're looking at it on your phone or on your app. If you're using uh, continuous glucose monitoring, then there are apps like the Clarity app for Dexcom, which allows for remote access. So if you're using technology, take advantage of the technology and find out how you can share stuff with the clinic ahead of time. But if you're not using technology, well then old school works fabulous as well. This is a pregnancy patient of mine who just literally takes a picture of her log book and then emails it. That works too, right? So any of those modalities would be very effective so that again, that conversation is gonna be more fruitful uh, for both of us. And then there's a question of, is it safe to start new medications at this time? Now, again, in the very early beginnings of the pandemic, so mid, mid to late March, it was not, it was fairly common that I'd have a conversation with a patient and I'd suggest certain medication changes and they'd be like, well, you know what, I don't really want to change anything right now. I'm, I'm kind of worried because if I have a side effect, I need to go to the hospital, I'm afraid to go, et cetera. But then maybe for those first two weeks, that's understandable because we really didn't know where we were going. But at this stage of the game, completely in my mind, not acceptable. Because we don't know how much longer this is gonna go on. I think that we are at a point now where we understand, we understand COVID-19 a bit better. Things in Canada are, knock on wood, relatively well controlled at this time. And we need to still take care of chronic diseases, diabetes being one of them. So absolutely, I think it's okay to start new medications during this time. Your healthcare team is available to you. Your diabetes team is available. Your family doctor is available. Your endocrinologist is available. They may not be available in person, but they're available by telephone. They're available virtually. And if there really was a problem, the hospitals are available. So things are still available. The labs are still open. We can still get stuff done. The pharmacies are open. You can still get your medication. So absolutely, I would hate to waste time and not make changes when changes are necessary to be made. And that includes injectable therapies because now more than ever, you can watch videos online to learn how to do injections. And there are all sorts of uh, resources available out there. And I've certainly started insulin. I've started inject other injectable therapies. People are doing Zoom meetings with their local nurse who's showing them how to do the injection. So a lot of stuff can still be accomplished even during this time. And finally, how, how do I deal with the stress, right? Because all of this is, it's scary stuff, right? It's scary, it's stressful. Certainly at the beginning, emotionally, it was very difficult for everybody, myself included. So what, what do we, what can we do to deal with the stress? And, and I come back to the concept of what you can control and what you cannot control. And to be honest, I come back to this concept all the time for myself, for many things, not just related to COVID-19 but it's reminding yourself what you can control and what it is that you can't. And for the things that you can't, then let it go. Because if you cannot control it, then thinking about it, worrying about it is going to be a vicious cycle because you can't control it. But for the things that you can focus your attention on and can control, well then focus your attention on that because you can, you can affect it, whereas the others you can't. So the things you cannot control are on the outside of the circle. You can't control if others are social distancing. You can't control what others are doing. You cannot predict what's going to happen. We try to, but we can't. You can't control other people's motives, how others react. You don't know how long this is gonna last. You can't control the amount of toilet paper at the store. These are things you cannot control. But the things that you can control is if necessary, turn off the news. Stop reading the social media. Find some fun things to do. Looking at, the, at your attitude and trying to think about more positive things. You can control your social distancing and your masking and your hand washing. So there's things that you can control and that's what I would suggest focusing on. Going for walks, physical activity, extremely powerful. In the early days of the pandemic for myself, I mean, it, it was stressful and emotionally it was getting very difficult. 
And one of my saving graces was I lived fairly close to my office was I don't normally drive to my office. I started walking to my office. So every day, twice a day, I would have a walk to and from, and it was actually very, very useful to get fresh air. I uh, put my air, air bod, AirPods in and just sort of listen to music. And it was downtime, um, quiet time and exercising time. And it's incredibly powerful just to change your scenery and to get out there and go for a walk. Having a routine, I think, is very important. Uh, this whole working from home thing or this whole pandemic, some people have lost their jobs. I mean, all of that, the routine completely got turned upside down. And trying to reestablish a routine is actually quite critical. Uh, in my case, I found that very important. I started making sure that I did phone calls still from my office, even though I wasn't seeing patients in my office, I would still go to my office. So I would still get up in the morning, same time as I always did. And I would make my way to the office and be there all day during the work day and then make my way back home. So there was still some routine in whatever it is I was doing. And then finally, I think that the power of gratitude is quite important. So yes, this pandemic is terrible in so many ways, but at the same time, I think it's also shown some really positive things. And making a list of what those positive things are, writing them down, literally writing them down can be very helpful as something you can reflect on when you're not feeling so great. So things either that society has done well, humanity has done well, or this even in your own life, the things that you are grateful for. And I think that's very powerful. And if you're finding that the stress is really getting to you and emotionally it's very difficult to handle, then please talk to your healthcare team about it. And there are certainly treatments that can be offered in that situation. Don't suffer alone. Uh, there's lots of av available help out there and I would certainly ask for that help. So to summarize, age, being male, overweight or obesity, living with diabetes, lower socioeconomic status, all of those things are in fact risk factors for more severe COVID-19 infection. But remember, you're not at higher risk of getting COVID-19. It's simply greater risk of complicated disease. Glycemic control or sugar control is still important. I cannot guarantee you or promise you or be positive that absolutely will protect you. However, it certainly wouldn't hurt. So I think it's worth controlling what you can. And one of those things is, in fact, your blood sugars. Know about sick day management. Know about low sugar management. Get your blood work done, you still can. Keep your appointments, they're virtual appointments, but be prepared for them. And therefore it becomes a more efficient and effective appointment. And, and just be prepared for everything that could potentially come at you. But remember what you can control and remember what you can't control. And also remember the things that we are to be grateful for in the context of this pandemic. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to future opportunities where we can learn from each other.